It is a cold gray day in December, just two weeks before Christmas. The sea hunters, accompanied by Vili Kram, enter the caves of Dora for the first time. As part of the reclamation of this historic site, some of the tunnels have been modified for visitor safety precautions. But the majority of the tunnel network, stretching for kilometers into the rock, is just as it was left 60 years ago. Reminders of the past litter the stone floors. Machinery, tools, rocket components lie rusting in the damp and darkness. To access the entryway into the flooded lower levels, the sea hunters will hike further into the restricted portions of the tunnels, carrying their dive and camera gear over broken rock and jagged steel. This is the portal back to 1945. A grim pit, sinister and foreboding for divers used to the open sea. Below, the factory tunnels have been flooded since the Americans left. Their shame, hidden for decades. Certain sections of the tunnels housed assembly lines for the V-1 flying bombs, as well as aircraft engines, and other sophisticated assemblies. But most of Mittelwerk, was devoted to the production of the V-2s. Some of the tunnels at Dora lie beneath the water table. And so during their operation, power was on, pumps were constantly pulling the water out to keep the tunnels from flooding. When the American troops left the area, the power was cut and the pumps turned off. With the power gone and the pumps silent, the water began to rise. And eventually, the lower levels of those tunnels were flooded with cold, clear water that sealed them for decades. Got it. We had to very carefully consider dropping our divers down into this hole. From just above the hole from where we're standing is a three by three concrete slab, which is tipped and uh, could potentially slide down into that opening at any time. I'd never seen an area where the silt was as fine as it was in this, in this workshop. We didn't have the luxury of being able to shoot it twice. If we had stirred things up, it would take a week for that silt to settle again. And that was something we couldn't do. We had one chance to get it right. The water inside the flooded area was clear where silt and rust had not begun to muddy it up. And yet, looking up towards the surface, my bubbles were dislodging bits of rust you could see a scum of rust on the surface. Mike and Jim are as close as anyone can now be to the heart of Hitler's vengeance weapons program. The components that were built in this string of workshops were amongst the most technically advanced and complicated mechanisms known to warfare. Perhaps the last people here prior to this visit were striped suited slave laborers who, over 50 years ago, sat at these tables, cold and half-starved. Kapos and German guards standing watch over their shoulders as they manufactured the final critical pieces of the weapon that would change the world. 
Preserved in these cold waters is the site where the finest components of the V-1 and V-2 rockets were assembled. Gyros and guidance systems that kept them on target. Electronic circuitry and switches which calibrated the fuel flow to their engines. All the small critical components that were essential for these sophisticated weapons to deliver their deadly payloads to London, Antwerp, Paris and other civilian centers as part of Hitler's effort to terrorize the Allies and to weaken their resolve for war. I could see Mike at the end of the room, and he was up at a doorway that led into another area. So I swam up to him and looked over his shoulder, and it was incredible. Paint still on the walls, a shelf, a, a desk in one corner. You really had a sense that this workspace, this tiny enclosed now flooded spot was where people had struggled and had worked at the end of the war and as we hovered there together time was literally standing still it's incredible i mean it's just like they left you really felt like you were dropping back into that that office that workshop 1945 well, this is this is to me, this is just the wonder of getting underwater. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if this had been on land uh, and accessible, there'd be nothing there. No. The fact is that you can actually go back and access it, yeah. and yes. but only in a very special circumstance with all of this equipment. Right. It makes it possible mm -hmm. to go back in time. The team moves to another section of tunnel. Here. The V-1 buzz bombs or doodle bugs were mass produced in the thousands to be shipped out to the launch sites of France and Holland. Again, here was a flooded area that was untouched since 1945. Imagine that the ceiling beams had supported a floor that held parts. And as we progressed along this tunnel, the rockets too progressed along the tunnel. And at each stage, the parts were assembled so that at the end of the line, you would have a completed rocket. And so as you moved over and under the beams, you entered into new storage areas for the parts. We'd see components uh, as big as the main body fuselage, or perhaps a nose cone, and yet other areas would contain engine parts. And although it wasn't clear what each component was, you could see the differences as you move along the assembly line. And you also saw things like the original signs that were there to uh, either to designate different component areas or just simply warning signs. It, it was an unlike a modern factory. As you went back, there's just different levels of equipment? Oh yeah, it, it's as if this were a, a workshop or a sort of assembly area and each partition represents a new uh, function or a, a new um, station for pieces maybe to be added or to be wow. stored. 